but we know that um, that there will always be a umbilical cord. Umbilical cord? How do you say that word? Um, umbilical cord attached to your church here. And we'll always love you and pray for you and, and sustain you and help you in all, any way that we can. For those of you who would like one of these books, it's for new believers. It's a new believer handbook. We have them. It gives you instructions. It's very, very good. Um, what happened to me? Where, where do I go from here? How can I understand the Bible? How can I pray effectively? How can I be a strong Christian? And what does God expect of me? How can I know the will of God? And what are the two baptisms? And then what now? And so um, I think if you would really get one of these, if you're wondering about Christianity and wondering about what's next, because people ask me all the time, what do I do now? How do I, what's, what's required of me? And so I gave my friend Joe one of these, and he just ate this thing up. And he told me uh, the other day, he, says, he said, Bob, he said, I can't wait to come to church. He says, I want to bless the church with my finances. I want to bless them with tithes and offerings. He says, I can't wait to come in fellowship. So I'm believing God is going to bring him back to New Bedford. Amen, and that um, that he will be a part of our fellowship, and who knows what God will have in store for him. Amen. Praise God. How to implement change, and what are the hindrances to change? Heavenly Father, I ask that you would bless your word today. Father, as we open it, God, I rely totally upon your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I ask you, Lord, to give me revelation and wisdom to know what you want to speak to your children today. Father, this is not my church, it's your church. These are not my people, they're your people. And so God, whatever you want to accomplish in their hearts and in their minds today, I pray God that you will accomplish it, that you will do it, that you will give me the insight that's needed to be able to provide that which they need. And I ask your anointing upon it in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you don't, it will be up on the screen for you. Uh, turn with me, please, to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 11, it's in the Old Testament. It's right after the book of Jeremiah. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Right before the book of Daniel. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to be starting with verse uh, 17. It says, Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you. Can we do something this morning? We used to do this a long time ago, and we got away from it. Could we stand as we read God's Word? Just out of respect for the Word of God this morning. It'll only be a couple of minutes, maybe not even that. So let's read again. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the people and the assemble you outside, out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. They shall come thither, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof, and all of the abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take a stony heart out of, out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes, keep my ordinances, and do them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things, and their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their own heads, saith the Lord God, and everyone said, you may be seated, praise the Lord. <clears throat> I posted a video on Facebook um, the other day about a Fox News um, alert that they were giving people, it was uh, Shepard Smith, I believe, who was stating that the scientists and seismologists and and those who are into the earthquakes and stuff are saying that there is going to be a magnitude 9.2 earthquake hitting the West Coast almost any time. They're about 100 years overdue, and they've, they did some research, and they found that every 240 years, or every 240 years, for several, several years, 
going back, earthquakes have been in this particular place. It's going to be so catastrophic. It's going to be so devastating. They're talking about tens of, tens of thousands of people losing their life, homes, uh, schools, over 3,000 schools will be destroyed. It's going to happen up in the Oregon, Washington uh, state area. Um, they said that when this plate begins, it's, it's stuck underneath right now, but once it slides, it's going to cause a 9.2 earthquake. And this is, this is scientists, this is Fox News reporting. This is not something on the Internet. This is Fox News reporting this, that it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. And the, uh, the last time we, 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 ha we haven't had one is over 300 years. And so it's every 200, 200 to 240 years, so we're overdue. The 9.2 earthquake, what's going to happen is it's going to cause a wall of water to go out toward Japan and then come back. It's going to come back at, at, at a height of almost 100 feet on the west coast. It's going to be devastating. And people were asking me, well, what can we do about it? Well, <laughs> you need to pray and ask the Lord what to do about it. Um, these signs and these things that are happening in the world are God's way of waking us up and telling us, you need to get ready before I come. One thing about New England and one thing about living in the northeast region of America is that I found over the years that the North American East region people don't like to change. They get into a little, like, rut, and they stay in that rut, and, you know, they just abide there, and they don't, they don't like to move. And um, it can be very detrimental to people because all they see is New Bedford, Fayetteville, Dartmouth, Cushnet, and they never travel anywhere. And I can honestly tell you, from being a person that has traveled uh, around the world, really, is that there are so many different cultures and so many different things to see uh, that are just amazing at how God has created such diversity and such beauty in the, in the entire world. But I want to talk to you this morning about how to implement change and what are the hindrances to those changes. And as I read in verse 17, it says, Therefore, it says, Thus says the Lord God. Before we can begin to think about change, there has to be an authority to cause us to change. Now, I would refute anyone here that would tell me that if a state policeman pulled out into the highway as you were driving by and went like this to you to pull over, that you would defy that authority. I don't think you would, would you? You'd pull over immediately. Or if a policeman stopped you, at a construction place and said, you're not going to go, you're going to wait your turn, you're going to stop. If you would just defy that and go. Why do you think people won't do that? The reason is, is because where there's authority, there's accountability and responsibility. And what I found is, is that when we talk about God or we talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, his authority, because he's invisible, because he's leaves mostly the choices up to our divine choice of will, whether we, we want to or we don't. We seemingly think that that is uh, okay. But when God speaks and God says something, he means it. And it's amazing how we give man the authority and the place in our life, but we don't give the authority and the place to God. Because God wants us to change. I, I've been here, I've been a, a Christian, and I've been with, with the Lord for over 30 some odd years. And I'm still changing. I still need to change. I still need areas of my life that God has to take more control over. It's, it's going to be, it's gonna be a, 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 a long walk. It's not going to be just something God does overnight. But at least we have to make the efforts in allowing God, who has the authority in our life, if we are truly Christians. I say if we're truly Christians because you cannot have Jesus just as your Savior. Jesus cannot be just your Savior. Jesus can't be divided up into little pieces and say, well, Jesus I'll take as my Savior, but I won't take him as my Lord. 
I'll make my decisions. I'll make my choices. I'll go and do what I want to do. I'll say what I want to say. I'll be what I want to be. I'm sorry. You cannot be a Christian and have that kind of mentality. When you become a Christian, and we've said this probably in the sinner's prayer when we pray to God, and we said, God, I want to be saved. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be the Lord and Master of my life. Do you understand what that means? You understand that when you give over your will, you're giving your will over to the Lord by allowing Him to be Lord and Master of your life. And so therefore, your choices are no longer going to be yours. Your rights are not, are not, are not going to be yours anymore. You're going to do what He wants you to do. You're going to listen to His voice. You're going to read His Word. And whatever He says for you to do, you're going to do. That's what it means to be a Christian. And how to implement the change and... What the hindrances to change are, are vital for your growth. I don't want to just come to church week after week and just have a, hear a nice message and do some praise and worship and then leave here the same as when we came. I did that in the religion I was with before. I went to church, did the things that they wanted me to do. I, you know, I kneeled down, stood up, did all those things, but I was never changed. And it was only until I allowed Christ to be the Lord and Master of my life that change began to take place in my life. And so here we see, he says, thus says the Lord God. He says, I'm going to gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered. In other words, whatever is scattered in your life, whatever is going on in your life, whatever you still have allowed in your life, God is beginning to gather you back into the will of His purpose for your life. He wants you to be gathered back in. And he says this, he says, I will give you the land of Israel. What's the land of Israel? It's the promise. It's the promise. God promised the land of Israel to his people. What is the land of Israel? It's the land of milk and honey. It's the land where, where you will have liberty and freedom to, to worship God and to change and begin to allow God to do things in your life and you begin to do things for God. He says, I will give you the land of Israel. And verse 18 says, And they shall come here, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof and all the abominations thereof from there. Before you can change, you have to sit down and decide, what are the things in my life that need to go? What are the things that God is targeting in my life that need to go? We heard Leisha this morning say about fear and about worry. And those things have to go. But there are hindrances to those things going. But I want you to notice in verse 18, it says, they shall come hither and they shall take away. They shall take away. God is not going to take away those things. You can't sit back and say, okay, God, you do it. No, God says there's things that you need to do. God says there are things that you need to do. You need to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, the Bible says. You've got to do these things. But what is the hindrance? What is the hindrance? Well, there's a spirit out in the world, and we know that. There's a worldly spirit out there that is so contrary to the Christian faith, so contrary to your Christian walk. And in verse 12, if we can go there for a moment, he says, And you shall know that I am the Lord, for you have not walked in my statutes, neither executed my judgments. What was happening there? They were living in a community that had no regard for God. He said, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't honor or you didn't walk in my statue. You didn't walk in the ways that I asked you to walk. 
And the reason why is because there's a lot of people out there that are religious, that call themselves Christians, but they walk contrary to the Word. They walk contrary to what it means to be a Christian. And so what happens is, and you can turn television on, you can actually see that. And so what happens is, is that people begin to believe the lies of the philosophies and the ideologies of the world, and they adapt those th that thinking, they adapt that lifestyle, and they adapt those things that they're allowing in their life, thinking that it's okay. He says, you haven't walked in my steps, neither they executed my judgments. And if we look at that, people are not speaking up. Not only out in the world, uh, to the world, but also speaking up about things in their life. They're not executing God's judgment. What does God say about it? We're finding more and more of the Christian church, and I can only use this as an example because it's, it's fresh in our minds with the news about the um, uh, homosexual lesbian marriage thing that just passed. And Christians are expected to shut their mouths because they're afraid of being labeled a hate crime. But, no. We're not executing God's judgments. What does God say about it? What does God say about those little things that you allow in your life? What is God saying about the, 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 the liberalism that has crept into your thinking? What about those things that God is pointing out in your life? Whether it be, uh, you know, unbelief or, or doubt or fear or, or whatever it may be. How are you handling that? Are you not judging those things and saying, you know what? No, I'm not going to allow that to get a hold of me. I'm not going to allow that to form my personality. I'm not going to allow that to to cause my, my growth to, to be stunted, I'm not going to allow that. You're going to make God's judgment over those things in your life. Verse 5 says this, And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak thus, saith the Lord, Thus have ye said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. God knows what comes into your mind and into your thoughts and how you can justify your lifestyle. God knows those thoughts. God says, hey, listen, you're not executing my, you're not walking in my statutes. You're not walking in my judgments. You're not standing up and proclaiming what is right and what is wrong. That's so wrong with society. That's why, you know, I get upset when I see a criminal who goes out and rapes somebody, like there was a few, about a year or two ago in Vermont, and the guy got like four months. And then you get a guy like I, I, know, I know of in Florida. And Florida has three strikes and that's it, you're in, you're in prison for life. But he happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And he was on probation. Guess what? Now he's doing life in prison for something so minor. Was it a mistake? Yes, but something minor. You've got people who have committed multiple murders that are getting out on parole. It's an injustice. The judgments are not correct. And that's what happens. The enemy will run loose in your life if you're not making God's judgments upon your life. You, you, you'll be up one minute, down the next minute, in one minute, out the next minute. You'll be all over the place because you need God's judgments to put you in that place where you'll be able to change. He says, I know what's in your mind. I know how you try to, how you try to finagle things in your mind and how you try to talk your way out of doing my will. God knows that. Every thought He knows. He knows what's going through your head right now as you're listening to this message. He knows how you're trying to justify yourself being where you are right now in Him. So first and foremost, to be able to implement change, you have to have a divine authority in your life. 
You've got to understand and say, God, I am giving myself to you. You are my divine authority in life. And you have every right to tell me what I can do, what I can't do, where I can go, where I can't go, what I can say, what I can't say, what I can think, and what I can't think. That's what it means. And I know that we're all at different levels in Christ and we're all, we're all growing in Christ. So what we need to do is we need to, right where we are, stop and say, Lord, what areas of my life that you have not taken over? Because I want to tell you something. The most dangerous place to be is, is, is in a place of stagnation. If you're in a place of stagnation, some people think, well, I'm just stuck here. No, you're not. No, you're not. If you take a fish in a, in a stream that's really, really rough, if that fish just decides he's just going to stand still, he's really going backwards. That water, that, that, that current will take him backwards. If he just stops swimming, he just, he's going to go backwards. In the same way with us, when we just stay stagnated with God, when we stay stagnated with God, what's going to happen is we won't grow and we're going backwards. That's what's called backsliding. And I'm telling you, there are more people in churches today that are backslidden from God than there are that are not going to church anymore. You say, well, how do you know that, Pastor? Because look at the growth. If I can be in God for 30 years or more and still need to grow and still need to develop and still need to turn things over to God, Still need to be more educated. Still need to understand more of the things of God. Understand more of His Word. Then how about you? Maybe know the Lord five years, ten years, or more. Because you have not walked in my statutes, neither executed my judgments, but have done after the manner of the heathen that are round about you. The church is influenced by the world. Um, Brother Tom, is that air conditioner on back there? Yeah, I want to check. If it's not, just lower it a little bit so it goes back on. Because, And also, I forgot to announce too, Sunday school teachers do not touch the air conditioning back there. I think it was last week or the week before, someone had touched it and it went off and it was hot as anything in here. And what we're going to say is if you have to be back there, just grab a sweater or something, you know, and uh, we're going to work it out. Pastor Tom and I are trying to get a time to get those, that bent, that pipe out into the sanctuary. Hopefully soon. And so God wants us to deal with these issues. These are hindrances to change. Some of the hindrances, as I said before, one of the greatest hindrances is stubbornness. Stubbornness is as a sin of idolatry. Did you know that? That's what the Bible says. Stubbornness is as a sin of idolatry. If you're stubborn about things, you're worshiping your opinion, that has become your God, and God is not the Lord of your life. Because God doesn't care about your opinions. That's why he says that you need to be, and I need to be washed by the renewing of our minds. We need to have our minds renewed by, by the way that God thinks and not the way that we think. And so, again, if we're not willing, he said, when you go in, he says in verse 18, he said, when you come in, they shall take away all the detestable things thereof and all the abominations thereof from there. You have to do that. I shared a, a little clip one time, I don't know if you remember it, with um, Bob Newhart. And he was counseling a lady. And she said, uh, she went for counseling, you know, and he's, he's a counselor. And <clears throat> make a long story short, I can give you the sharp version of it. She said, uh, he said, okay, well, what's your problem? She says, I have a fear 
that I'm going to be put into a box. So he said, wait a minute. You, you mean to tell me that you're living your whole life in fear that someone's going to put you into a box? She said, yes. She says, I'm terrified. And then he says, well, he says, um, I, I've got the answer for you, he says, and, and I think uh, I'll give it to you in two words. And, uh, you know, I think if you take these two words that you'll be able to be free from what you're going through. And she, she, gets, she gets her pen out. He says, well, you don't need to write it down. It's only two words. I think you'll remember it. And she goes, he says, are you ready? She goes, yeah. He goes, stop it. She goes, he says, stop it. Just stop it. Why is it that we have such a problem stopping it? We do everything and anything else we want to do. Hello? Even if it's sinful, we still want to do it. We do what we want to do. But when it comes to being obedient, we say, oh, I can't help it. I can't do it. Stop it. It's very simple. God gave us a free will. God gave, and if your will's not free, then you need deliverance. Because the Bible says sin will not have dominion over you. If sin has dominion over you in your life, it's because you're not giving that area over to God. So my advice to you, stop it. You can do it. God would not ask you to do things if you didn't have the ability in you to do it. Once you, once you establish God as your authority, once that's a settled issue, okay, and once you have decided that you're going to execute His judgments in your life, see, because... What you need to do is, if you look at things in your life and you know you're thinking about doing something that's not right, you execute God's judgments. If I do that, then I know this is going to happen. Therefore, I'm going to weigh out that, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bring judgment to that. Do I want to pay that price? No. So then it's not worth it. So you sit down and make those judgments, and you walk in His ways. Then he says, if you establish the authority of God in your life and give him the rightful place as the head of your life, your life for you women that are single, put him as your husband for now until God brings the real one around. I mean, not the real one, but the, the one that you can see and have a relationship in the natural realm. Make him your, make him your husband. Make him your love. Make them your first love. I believe a lot of times what happens is people don't, don't get their mate because they got the mate before God. They can get, oh, I was quiet. But that's the truth. When we put someone or something before God, you'll never get that thing. God will not allow it to happen. He said, I'll have no other gods before me. He's a jealous God. He loves you with an everlasting love. He's, you know, that's, that's, that's like, you know, that's like saying if I was Carolyn's boyfriend, okay, and Carolyn was over there flirting with Cam and, and, and had his arm around her and stuff like that, I'd be jealous. I'd be like, hey, what are you doing? You know, you and I are supposed to be in a relationship, and here you are trying to mess around with Cam, you know. I'm going to knock your block off, you know. And I'm just trying to be, I'm trying to give a, a, an illustration so you understand that that's how God is with us. He's jealous of us. He doesn't want anyone or anything to take his place in your life. And that's what it means to establish his authority in your life. And then God says this. See, you have to make the first effort. You have to take the detestable things away. You have to make, you have to do that. But in the process... How many know that faith has works? Okay. So if you want to show God you have faith, you begin. And as you begin, look what God says he'll do in verse 19. He says that, well, let's go to 18. And they shall come here, and they shall take away all the detestable things that are in all the abominations from, from there. Okay, when, when, I, when a person got saved, 
you know, if they had any idols in their home, if they had anything that was a, a, an abomination to God, they took them all out. But you can take them all out on the outside and not take them out on the inside. So what does God say? Taking them on the outside is enough? No. This is what he says, verse 19. He says, and I will give them one heart. When you take the steps forward, when you make that effort to make sure that everything is right with God, God will give you one heart with His. When you have that one heart with His, something is going to take place. One heart with His. One heart with His. And I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you. I have a video clip I want you to watch. It's about, about eight, nine minutes. But I want you to watch it, and I'm going to watch it with you. I've been watching it, and it really touched my heart because Dave Wilkerson um, did it. And um, I believe that it's, there's such a deep message there for us, especially in these last days because there's so many voices speaking to us and clamoring for our attention. And again, those are the things that he says. I know it's in your mind. And he says, because the heathen that are around you. And what happens is sometimes we get influenced by what we are around. Amen? If we get influenced by what we're around, we have to be very careful. So I'm going to ask, uh, Tom, would you play that clip right now? And I'll be right back with you in just a short message. Jesus delighted in the knowledge that one day we would grow up to become his habitation. That he could come and dwell and abide in us. I have called you friends for all things that I've heard of my Father I make known to you. He anticipated you being a man of prayer, a woman of prayer, and that he in quiet times could give you the secret of his heart. He would open this word to you. You would see things that nobody else saw or heard. He would speak life to you. This was why he delighted. I'm going to have a people. I'm going to have a bosom friend in my bride. Someone I can talk to. Someone I can share the burden of my heart with. His secret is with the righteous, as scripture says. He anticipated a love relationship with you so intimately he rejoiced. In the anticipation of his bride delighting in his word, David himself in Psalms 118, 19 describes what those gates are. Open to me the gates of righteousness. And this is the believer. This is the child of God who goes daily to the word of God anxiously getting the word of the Lord on how to walk in righteousness and holiness. This is the one who says, I want to walk before the Lord with a pure heart. I want truth in the inner man. And I can't get it from somebody else. I can't get it from books and tapes. Oh God, I go to your word and I wait at your gate, at the gate of righteousness. I wait for you to open that gate to me. And folks, that's the reason we beg and plead with you. Read this book daily because this is the gate of righteousness. This is the gate. Here's Jesus rejoicing before the world was made, rejoicing and delighting over what he anticipates. He's looking into the future, to the latter days. He anticipates coming to his habitation. So tell me, now that you know that Jesus anticipated before you were born, you have time for shopping, you have time for gardening, you have time for everything, and you have no time for God. You have no time for the bridegroom. And he anticipated this for eons. This was his delight before the world was created. He looked forward and longed for that time with you. I'm not talking about going to church and listening to sermons. This is about people who are falling so short of what God had planned for their life. They've missed it. He had it in his mind to draw you so close to himself. He had it in his mind to have such sweet fellowship with you, to open his heart, to fill you with the knowledge of himself. He had so many things he wanted to show you. He wanted you to be so in love with him that you couldn't endure a day without being shut in with him. 
He wanted to take away your weaknesses, your fears, your feelings of inadequacy, your rejection. He wanted to teach you how to know and hear His voice. Now I'm going to bring a solemn warning now. And folks, I am trembling. Jesus will not abide in a temple that ignores Him, that neglects Him. Absolutely impossible. When, when you don't go to your Bible day after day, week after week, when you don't seek the face of God, nobody sees you through the week except by hearing prayer. You may come to all the meetings. You come to the meetings and, and that's it. That's it. But you have no personal relationship in private. You have no time for Him in private. If you don't hear what I'm about to tell you, all your work's going to burn when you stand before Christ. All your work's going to be you're going to stand empty, fruitless, nothing to bring to the Master. And all of that anticipation He had, all that great desire toward you, you've aborted. Now let me tell you, it's never too late to start over. Never. Lord, before this day is over, I'm going to get alone with you. And I'm going to rehearse this truth in my heart, that I tremble at God's Word. God hit my soul. God dealt with me, and I receive it. In this chapter that chills me to the bone, chills me to the bone, has shaken me to the core of my soul. And if you'd ask him where, where did this divine order came from, he, would tell, he wouldn't point to his half million man army. He wouldn't point to all the buildings he'd built and all the walls he'd built and all of the inventions that he had invented. He wouldn't point to any of that or of his own ability. He would say, the secret is, I go to my closet and I pray. I seek God and in prayer he tells me what to do, where to go, and he gives me promises. That's all there is, no other secret than that. Now why would God send a prophet with a warning to a man who's just won the greatest victory in his career, in his life? And God understands the danger of those who love Him, those who are holy, those who are godly, the danger of becoming weary and relaxing and becoming spiritually lazy after the greatest victories. He's a I bring a word from God's throne to you. Be diligent now. Be diligent more than you've ever... You're going to need God more than you've ever needed Him now. You've had a great victory. God has blessed you. God has blessed you so, but now you're going to need it. You're going to be tested like you've never been tested in your life. Now, God wants to reward you. God has plans for you. Be careful lest you get so busy unless you get to building and into projects unless your family unless your ministry unless other things come in and track you and take your time the anointing will lift the favor will lift the divine order will be gone and you'll just be like every other generation that has failed lost their faith but when he's 70 years of age God came to George Mueller and said, You've been a man of prayer, but now I want you to pray more than you've ever prayed because I've got something else. I've got something for your last days. At 70 years of age, this man renewed his prayer life. This man sought God as he never sought Him. Even at 95, he was still preaching. He traveled for 25 years around the world and stirred and changed the lives of thousands of ministers because he stayed on his face. He didn't miss out. He didn't lose his faith. He didn't lose his anointing because he stayed on his face before God. And yet I can tell you the story after story of men of God who've been used, who had anointing, who were blessed of God, who were men of prayer, who were prophets. And in their older age, in their mid-sixties, and in their seventies, and I've been with some of them. And all I hear are stories of old-time religion or old revivals, and there's no new word because the man is sitting in front of a TV set now. He doesn't set my soul on fire. I don't want my children, my grandchildren, who love to hear me pray, who love to hear the voice of God through my lips, I don't ever want my children to see the grief and shame of me sitting in front of a television all day, never opening my Bible, not seeking God, saying, what happened to Dad? God, keep me broken. God.
Keep this church broken. God, don't let us sit back on a crest of blessing and get lazy and see disorder come again to this house. We don't want to stand and sermonize in this pulpit. We don't just want crowds. We want your glory in this house, oh God. We want your glory in your power. Oh God, I tremble at your word. Let us tremble this morning that it's possible for godly men and godly women who once prayed, who once had such an anointing to finally lose it in this day of temptation when all hell is breaking loose. God, help us determine I will seek God. I will seek God with all my heart and all my soul and all my strength and all that's in me. Examine your heart right now. Tell me, have you been on your face? Have you given God time every day now? Are you seeking Him at all? Are you crying out to Him? Are you praying and seeking God that He'll give you revelation of Himself? Are you seeking Him? Here's your prophetic word from heaven. If you seek me, you'll find me. If you continue forsaking me, I will forsake you. Right now you set your heart He knows what's in your mind. He knows what's in your heart. As I said earlier, the times that we're living in are getting worse and worse. The temptations are getting stronger and stronger. The attacks on Christians and their families and their lives are getting fierce. And unless you are willing, and I am willing, to seek God. Doesn't matter how old you are in God, that's not going to sustain you. Doesn't matter how many times you read the Bible, that's not going to sustain you. What is going to sustain you is a personal relationship with God. Someone asked me a question last week. They said, What do I need to do to repent? How do I stay in a place of repentance? You stay in a place of repentance and how you examine that is by how willing you are to change. If you are willing to change. If you will implement the change that God is speaking this morning. It's not about giving more money. It's not about attending more meetings. It's not singing louder or singing on the choir. What is going to determine whether you make it or not is how much time you spend on your knees before God. We desperately need in this church prayer. We have not gone the way of the seeker-friendly church. And I thank God for that. But if you want to see your sons and your daughters saved, they're looking at you. Moms and dads, they're looking at your life. They're looking at you. Are they seeing you on your knees and praying? Are they seeing the hunger and the thirsting after God in your life? Or are they just hearing your screaming at them that they need to get do things right and stop that and they need to be Christians and they need to hear all over them to be a, to be a Christian? How they will see God move in your life is the drawing magnet that will draw them. Because no matter what we say, if they don't respect your authority as a parent, as I was saying from the beginning, if we don't have God's authority, here we opened up and the scripture says, Thus saith the Lord God. God is saying these things. God is promising these things. God says, if you will do this, I will implement the change 
if you will take care, care of the detestable things and the things that are abomination. And he says, then I will give one hot with me. I will give you a one hot with me. And you will want only the things that I want for you. And you will not presume or hope or think of anything outside of the will of God for your life. He says, I'll put a new spirit within you. Oh, how we need to have a renewed spirit in some of our lives. If I tell you to come to the prayer meeting, I can't force you. I can't make you. I can only give you God's instruction. The reason why so many Christians are so weak and they're so lazy and laid back is because they have no oxygen. See, when you have enough oxygen, oxygen brings life. Where do you get your oxygen from? You get it from prayer. Individual prayer, corporate prayer. Job was delivered when he prayed for his friends, but he had to be among his friends to pray for them. Amen. When we put others more highly than ourselves, we have the same heart as God. God's a giver. God gave His only begotten Son. God is a giver. And when He requires us to take away things, it's not because He's being mean. It's not because He doesn't, he doesn't want us to enjoy ourselves. Because he knows those things that he takes away from our life is going to cause hurt and pain and sorrow. If you've seen what I've seen, I was involved in bartending like my dad. And I was around liquor a lot of my life. But as a Christian, I've seen the damage it has done to families. I see how people are trying to escape their problems and their situations and trying to deal with issues in life through alcohol. And what it does, it destroys families. It destroys lives. There have been CEOs and people that have been uh, heads of major corporations, multimillionaires that are on skid row lost everything because of alcohol. Same with drugs. Same with cigarettes. You say, there's nothing wrong with that. And I, I, I told a friend of mine one time, God spoke to me and told me, tell her not to smoke. Something's going to happen. And my wife and I love this couple dearly and this woman dearly she had such a loving heart and when I told her she let it go in one ear and out the other she didn't listen God gave her space and time to repent because how many know God knows the beginning the middle and the end but see, when He's not an authority in your life, when you don't allow God to speak into your life. I know I have a friend, he says, I, I don't listen to anybody but God. I said, well, that's too bad because if you're going to try, try to tell God how He's going to speak to you, then you're going to lose out on hearing God. Because God can use a donkey. He did it in the Bible. And He uses people. And He can use unsaved people to speak to our hearts. When I told her, she didn't listen. And three years after that, she developed cancer all through her body. She died at 52 years old. Because we don't look at the seriousness of things. We don't look at the seriousness of when God warns us and tells us, don't do that. Don't go that direction. Don't go there. And we think, well, I can still do that. I can still do that. God's going to protect me. No, He won't. You heard the word. He says, if you forsake me, I'll forsake you. Yes, he will. That's God's word too. And 
And he says, they that walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them, they shall be my people. Are you hearing me? Verse 20. That they may walk in my statutes. He's going to give you a new heart. Some of us here this morning may need heart surgery. It's not a brain problem. It's a heart problem. Some of us may need to have a transplant. Take away that stony, hard, hot God that's in me. That's been developed inside of me because of the hardships of life. Maybe something has happened to you. Maybe you've had a rough life. And what you've done is developed a wall around yourself, of a protection, you call it. God calls, calls it an unwillingness to trust. An unwillingness be able to let me come into that area. Because God is not like man that he would go into that area of your life and hurt you. God's purpose isn't to hurt you. God's purpose is to design to love you. And to, but you must take down the detestable things. You must take the wall down that you have built up. That protection mechanism that you have surrounded your heart and surrounded your life, and saying, no one's ever going to do that to me again. That needs to come down. If you want to have true victory, if you want to have true fellowship, if you want to have Him truly as your Lord and Savior, you need to tear down those things that would separate you from the love of God. Because there are things that we've gone through in life, some hurts and pains, and my wife has, and I have, and you have gone through things, but we cannot allow those things to stop the heartbeat of God in us. He says, I'm giving you a new heart. One, I'm, going to give you, I'm going to give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh. In other words, he's going to give you a heart that's pliable for further development to grow in his ways. And then he says this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to give them a heart of flesh, but there's a purpose. And that purpose is that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances. See, you cannot do it in the flesh. It's a heart transplant. You've got to be willing to say, God, transplant my heart, my stony heart that I have, and replace it with a heart of flesh, so that I may walk in your ways and statues and keep your ordinances and do them. And then he says this, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. That's a covenant that God makes. If you do these things, if you allow Him, He will covenant with you and be your God. But then He gives us a warning in verse 21. He says, But as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things and their abomination." I will recompense their way upon their own heads, saith the Lord God. If you're going to be stubborn and want what you want, then it's going to come back upon you. And it's not going to be God's fault. It's going to be your fault. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Turn with me there for a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Starting with verse 14. He says, Be 
ye not unequally yoked together with what? Unbelievers. Why, doesn't God like unbelievers? No, He loves unbelievers. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He loves unbelievers. He wants to save unbelievers. But He tells us as Christians not to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. What does that mean? A lot of people automatically think of marriage. That's not only what it talks about. It talks about other things. To be yoked was when you had two oxen in a yoke. And if you had a donkey and an ox, the ox was stronger than the donkey. It would pull the opposite way. You would never get a straight farrow when you were plowing. And as I was reading this, God spoke to me and says, don't be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever in their philosophies and their ideologies, in their thinking. Why? Because they may take you, they may be the stronger one that will take you in a place that you do not want to go. They may take you off course. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Can I say in the church that we live in in the 20th century or 21st century today, the church is filled with idolaters, fornicators, adulterers, drug users, club goers, all kinds of living together out of wedlock, homosexual lesbian relationships going on on the worship team, and it's allowed in churches, all for the sake of money and finances and, and having the biggest church in the, and having so many crowded uh, crowds of people. That's being allowed in the churches today. You see, you see a person in church with their hands raised praising God, and on Friday and Saturday night, they're in a nightclub. Dancing to who knows what. Hello. But that's the reality. But we don't have judgment. And when a preacher gets up and he starts preaching these kind of things, they say, oh, you're being judgmental. No. We're supposed to. We're supposed to tell you the truth. Oh, I could have a church filled with people. I could have 500 people in this church if I just accommodate everybody. If I preach the gospel of accommodation. But I won't. Because it's not right. And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? If you are the temple of God and God dwells in you, why are you going to places where there is idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. Did you see that? Did you see that? Did you see that? You're shaking your heads, yes, but did you see it? God wants to walk in you. What does that mean? That means that God wants to go whatever part that's in you, He wants to walk in that place. Don't you ever close a door to God inside of you. Tell him, God, you can't go to this place. Because he's going to walk into those areas that you struggle with. And he's going to walk into those areas that you have a hard time with. And he wants to walk in those areas because he wants you to be free of those things. Amen. If only you'll let him walk in you. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then he says this in verse 17, Wherefore, because of these things, come out from among them. And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And he'll what? God's not going to receive you if you're not willing to walk out from that unclean thing. Hello? You've got to be willing. You've got to be willing. No one's perfect. But you've got to be willing. I don't care how many times you have to come to this altar. That's the other thing. You don't see that too often in churches now. People go into the altar. 
But I want this place to be a place that this altar is filled. Anytime you want to come to this altar for prayer, you come. It's open. I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you. What's a father? Today, that's a very loose word. We have fathers running off on their kids, running off on their wives, running off. Avoiding responsibility and accountability. God says, I will be a father. In other words, I'll be there when you need me. And I'll correct you when I need to correct you. And I'll give you instruction. And I'll tell you the way to do things and how to do things and the correct way to do things and the right mindset and how to respect authority and how to, how to apply your life to the things that I have for you. Oh, if we'd only listen to godly fathers. If we only had godly fathers. And we'll be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Turn with me real quick as I close in Ephesians. Chapter 4. Verse 6 says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Say that with me. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Come on, say it with me. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. If you want to know what it is to have the fruits of the Spirit, to have a solid root system in your life, that the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Verse 11, and have no fellowship. Say that with me. With the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather what? Reprove them or openly show them. That's how you live a life of repentance. That's how you know you'll be ready with the Lord. I'm not going to run with the world. People can look at my life, the kind of life I lived, what I used to do. If I could tell you some of the things that this little innocent woman did before she was a Christian, you would never believe it. Because you look at her face and she's got the face of an angel. She's got the smile that just puts a smile on your face. She's got that laugh, you know, that laugh she has that makes you giggle. That's not how she always used to be. She was a lot different before she was a Christian. Very independent. how God changes her, how God changes us. Don't go to the same places I used to go. I don't go out and do the same things I used to do. Because God has changed me. God has renewed me. Is there still room to grow? Yes, there is. Is there still room that God has to do in my life and walk in me? Yes, there is. But I have determined one thing. I won't go back. Never go back to the way it used to be before your presence came and changed me. I won't go back. Can we sing that, Brother Tom? Can you put that up when closing? We'll sing that song. I won't go back. I can't go back to the way it used to be. I tell you right now, I'd be dead. I would. I'd be dead and lost as a goose. But 
God wants to give you a new heart. A heart of flesh, not a stone. But there are things that you must do first to get out of the way. I'm telling you, I see more families divided, more families arguing and fighting and tearing each other apart because the enemy of your soul hates unity. He hates it. Can we stand and sing this song in closing? Are you determined you won't go back? Thank you.